What's cracking, y'all? You are now watching Boo TV. Appreciate you for stopping in. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and let's get into the topic for today. What's cracking? What's cracking? Back with another reaction video of the Making the Case Variety. This time, the 1986 Celtics. Now, I actually have a couple videos out regarding this specific Boston Celtics team, but we never got the the Clayton, you know, explanation and argument for them. You just heard, you know, testimony and players talking about the season and, you know, maybe my commentary on, you know, all the pieces of that team and, you know, what made it what made them elite based on my observations and studies. But, you know, Clayton does a great job of breaking this stuff down and making a case as the name uh, presumes making a case for this specific team as being the greatest basketball team of all time. For me, there's nothing he's going to say that's going to change my mind. Um, I've seen enough about this team and other teams, and I personally think it's the the um, 96 Bulls, but this team is definitely up there, no question about it. The Celtics team, monster, monster team. Anywho, I'm going to shut the hell up. Let's get into it. What's the goal of basketball? To win, right? But not just to win individual games. The ultimate goal is to win a championship. Of course, basketball is a team sport. Championships are won by the most complete, most inspired team. Every champion deserves credit. But the question on my mind is, who's the greatest team of all time? With apologies to Bill and Wilt, I have a list of eight teams since 1970 that I want to look at as having a claim to that distinction. It is a loaded question, and one that I ultimately can't answer. Is it the teams that were front runners from beginning to end? The ones who were unbeatable at their peak? Maybe the ones who tapped into something special and overcame countless obstacles? There is no right answer. It's your job to make your own call and it's my job to make the case. So today, I'll be making the case for the 1986 Boston Celtics as the greatest basketball team of all time. Some quick background. In the 1985 NBA Finals, the Los Angeles Lakers defeated the Celtics behind the heroic efforts of Magic Johnson and Finals MVP Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. It was the first time in history that the Lakers had defeated the Celtics in the Finals, going back as far as 1959. In the ensuing offseason, the Celtics made key roster moves, licked their wounds, then rattled off a league-high 67 wins on their way to raising the franchise's 16th championship banner. Their 67-15 record stands as the best record in Celtics history, and their 15-3 playoff record serves as a testament to their aptitude on both ends of the court. They trotted out the original Big Three of Robert Parrish, Kevin McHale, and the immortal Larry Bird, a dynamic backcourt of Dennis Johnson and Danny Ainge, and boasted a talented bench anchored by former league MVP Bill Wallace. Bill Wallace. Now, before we go any further, I want to reach out to some of you out there. Some of you might be a little jaded about this team, and that's because some of the most prominent and influential figures in sports media were around for and swear by this team. Your Bill Simmons, your Jackie McMullins, your Bob Bryans, they all have a connection to this squad in some way or another, so the discourse around the 86 Celtics has always had a certain amount of Boston-centric bias. Oh, that's I true. want you to know that I have no such bias. I was born and raised in Kansas. I don't give a shit about Boston. <laughs> Dunkin' Donuts can go to hell as far as I'm concerned. And I'm here to tell you that just because those writers were a little bit biased doesn't mean that they're wrong. True. With that said, where else do we start with the 86 Celtics than with Larry Bird? Joe 1986 Bird. saw Bird take home his third straight MVP, joining the historic company of just Wilt Chamberlain and Bill Russell. Never before had a forward submitted a better season than Bird's seventh campaign. He slapped up a 26, 10, and 7 and was decimal points away from submitting a 50, 40, 90 season. The man had a superlative basketball IQ and remains, for my money, the clutchest player to ever put leather through nylon. 
He had a blend of all-around skills that began garnering him goat talk from people like Bob Cousy and Jerry West. His tenacity on the boards defied his 6'9 frame. His creativity was tantamount to Tesla, and his infectious passing gave the team an identity that remains as impressive and timeless now some 35 years later as it was back then. Damn, that was a good pass. He finished the season ranked 7th in rebounds, 4th in points, 13th in assists, 8th in steals, and 2nd in minutes played. So elevated was his level of play that he admitted to getting bored in games and looking for ways to entertain himself, like taking increasingly ridiculous shots or playing portions of games left-handed. At the other forward spot was Kevin McHale. After back-to-back -back six Man of the Year awards as a super sub, 86 was McHale's first season as a starter, and he immediately began producing at an all-NBA level. With his 6'10 height and unsettlingly long limbs, McHale earned a reputation as one of the great two-way players in the league. Defensively, he was mobile and springy enough to move with quicker swingmen while being long and strong enough to contest interior scores. Offensively, there's a reason that Elijah Wan and McHale are the two names that get mentioned whenever someone talks about post players. Opponents trapped in McHale's torture chamber were subjected to an array of moves that left them confounded, wondering where on earth the man went and how the hell he'd gotten there. You never knew what he was going to throw at you. He'd combine fakes into an up and under, pivot into an uncontestable fallaway, or whatever else struck his fancy. It's still striking to see him twist and wind through defenders with his moves the same way Kyrie Irving splits defenders with his handle. Averaging 21 points and 8 rebounds a game on an otherworldly 57% field goal percentage, mm. McHale was a luxury for Boston. He would take on the toughest defensive assignment allowing Bird to roam and scored with enough efficiency and volume that his counterpart never had to carry the full offensive burden. Rounding out the big three was the man in the middle, the chief, Robert Parrish. As the unsung hero of the team, Parrish doesn't get talked about nearly as much as Bird and McHale, but make no mistake, the Chief was dangerous. Keeping in mind that these stats don't include Bill Russell because of a lack of recorded statistics, Parrish is still the Celtics all-time leader in offensive rebounds, defensive rebounds, blocks, and is still the NBA's leader in games played. You could rely on Chief for 16 and 10 with Duncan-esque consistency. The man was always in shape and feasted on opposing defenses simply by outrunning them. God only knows how many points he scored because he hustled his way down the court, setting up easy outlet passes. That's that's so true, and I can't remember which bird play it was. Oh, so I have a series called Amazing Plays where I break down. You, you can just go look at the playlist called Amazing Plays. I break down plays, but there's this one... Uh, there was a Larry Bird pass uh, where he, I think he was on the floor diving for a ball, and I can't remember if he, I can't remember how he did the pass exactly. It might have been over the shoulder. I can't remember exactly, but anyway, on on that play, you just see Paris freaking sprinting, sprinting. Chief just sprinting. That dude, that is so true. He shot well from the field, was a good free throw shooter, had a reliable jumper, defended rebounded, set Steven Adams-like picks, and did all the little things. There wasn't a ton of room for heroics on such a loaded roster, so you couldn't count on Parrish jumping out at you with a 39-point game, but he embraced being the third option the same way Scottie Pippen embraced being the second. Never forget that Robert Parrish held his own in the Age of Giants against Ralph Sampson, Elijah Wan, Kareem, Moses, Ewing, and the rest of them. At point guard was Dennis Johnson, one of the most underrated players ever. Yeah, it's yes. a video for another time, though. Yeah, yeah. For the Celtics, DJ fulfilled his role as the best defensive guard of his era. With nine straight all defensive selections from 79 to 87, only Kobe made more all defensive teams as a guard. He was the best matchup on Magic of any player in the league, set the table for everyone on his team, and consistently came through in money time. He and Bird had what some refer to as a telepathic connection, making tight wire action between them routine. He was the ringleader of the squad and Bird still calls him the best player he ever played with. At the other guard was Danny Ainge, 
a reliable double-digit scorer and wily little rascal that thrived on riling up the opposition and getting under their skin. <laughs> Ainge was also one of the great Ainge, shooters man. of the era and went on to demolish the single-season three-point record in 1988. A talented multi-sport athlete, Ainge remains the only high schooler to be named a first-team All-American in football, baseball, and basketball. Damn, I didn't know Ainge did all that. Coming off the bench was the Celtics' secret weapon, Bill Walton. Big red. Drafted first overall by the Portland Trailblazers in 1974, Walton had a transcendent stretch of basketball in the late 70s, guiding the Blazers to the NBA championship in 77 and winning league MVP in 78. Injuries derailed his career at the end of his 78 season, though, and he played in just 14 games over the next four seasons. By 86, Walton was a liability and a shell of the player he once was. Looking for redemption and one more chance to be a part of something special, he called Red Arback to see if the Celtics would be interested in trading for him. The deal went through, though health still remained the biggest question on everyone's mind. Could his body withstand the grueling championship campaign these Celtics were setting out on? Well, in the 100 games that the Celtics played that season, Walton played in 96 of them. He won the sixth man of the mm. year award thanks to his size, smarts, rebounding ability, and defensive instincts. He was still every bit of the best passing big man ever and found a kindred spirit in Bird, who also reveled in elevating the talent level of his teammates and in the fine details of basketball. To boot, Walton added an Andy Bernard dynamic to the team. He had had his good old days and seen them drain through his fingers. Yet here he was, once again, with good a chance ass. to be a part of something historic, completely aware and appreciative of the fact that this was and would always be the good old days of Celtics basketball. In all, the roster touted five Hall of Famers. Oof. Five. Yeah. A whole lineup. And every starter on the team was a double-digit scorer. They gelled together to form a hive mind presence, assimilating into yes. nothing short of Bird's brainchild. If Bird were cutting, DJ would put the ball where it was supposed to be the second it was supposed to be there. If Mikhail was rolling on some poor soul in the post and got doubled, Ainge would be in the perfect place for a kick out. If Parrish got open down the court, you could bet that the ball would find him. Emulating Bird's all-around prowess, the Celtics could beat you in any which way. Whatever you did, they did better. If you had a speedy, heady guard, you had the pleasure of being locked down by Dennis Johnson. If your calling card was your big men, you had to contend with the greatest front court of all time. Not razor sharp defensively, the hive mind will beat you into a pulp with their passing. Your offense isn't clicking on every conceivable cylinder. You would be swarmed, you would turn the ball over, and every shot you took would be smothered. And if you let the game stay close down the stretch, yeah, Larry Bird. Bird would put the nails <laughs> in your coffin. They had answers for everything. They could change their style of play on a whim and excel at it. Bird, Ainge, and backup point guard Jerry Seasting were all dead-eye shooters. The big men were some of the best post players to ever play. They could put out an absolutely massive lineup with Bird at the two, Mikhail at the three, and Parrish and Walton in the middle. They could go small with no loss of quality with Mikhail at center and Bird at the four. Craziest of all, they really wouldn't even need to size up or size down. The 86 Celtics are still one of the only teams in history to be able to play a small ball style with a gargantuan starting lineup. Yeah. Everyone was mobile enough to push the pace and stay active. Yeah. Their inside outside mm -hmm. proficiency could space the floor. They could defend and corral nearly all types of scores, and their passing would carve defenses to shreds all without giving up an inch. And, if we're checking boxes, the Boston Garden in the 1980s was the best home court in sport. The dingy dungeon halls of the Garden had been host to some of the greatest players and moments in sports history, offering comfort to its allies and peril to its enemies. The crowd was insatiable and earned a reputation for both their devotion and potential for viciousness. The rafters were littered with championship banners and retired numbers in such quantity that they became superfluous. 
The Celtics took advantage of this and ran with it, notching a 50-1 home record, including the playoffs. Were they perfect perfect? No. They weren't that athletic, and they had a tendency every now and then to get bored and take their foot off the gas against bad teams. Could they have gotten to 70 or even 72 wins? Sure. And you can uh, hold that against them, yeah. but tell me, when we're talking about something as grand as the greatest team of all time, how much do those three to five regular season games really matter? I knew that was coming. As we established in the beginning of the video, the Celtics lost the 85 finals to the Lakers for the first time in franchise history. The loss stung deep, and members of the team still believe that they let the series get away from them. With a newfound inspiration and the drive to reclaim what they believed was theirs, they tore through the league with one team in mind. The rivalry between the Celtics and the Lakers should need no background. Since the days of Jerry West and Elgin Baylor competing against Bill Russell and Bob Cousy, the two franchises have defined the NBA within and without. Today, the two franchises account for nearly half of all championships in NBA history. And the rivalry was never more intense than in the 80s, as Magic Johnson and Larry Bird presented their teams and their sport to the world. Since their iconic college basketball championship showdown, the two had assumed the role as battling titans, trading blows with one another, daring to push the boundaries of basketball to fit their own needs and desires. No pass was too extraordinary, Golly. no shot too outrageous. And after the Lakers had landed such a damaging blow in the finals, Bird and the Celtics were eager to return the favor. In the two regular season matchups between the two squads, the Celtics came away with victories both times against the defending champs. And while they no doubt enjoyed the bragging rights that this afforded them, their true crusade began in the playoffs. In round one, they found themselves matched up with the 40-win Chicago Bulls and an extraordinary young guard named Michael Jordan. Having missed most of the season with an injured foot, Jordan was eager to assert himself and unleash his latent talents. He did just that. After a 49-point performance in game one, Jordan put on a spectacle in Game 2 by setting the NBA record for most points in a single playoff game with 63. Bird famously described the effort as God disguised as Michael Jordan. It was a glimpse into the future of the NBA and a coming out party for the league's next great star. Ultimately for the series though, it didn't even matter. The Celtics won both games. Not even such an extraordinary performance as Jordan's was enough to dent the armor of the Celtics, who then won game three to sweep the series. And after killing God, <laughs> I can't say that. In the next round, Boston <laughs> was faced with MVP runner-up and the league's leading scorer, Dominique Wilkins, and his Atlanta Hawks. Though the Celtics had won all four of the regular season matchups with the Hawks, each contest was decided in the single digits and most had come down to the final moments. Dominique represented Bird's toughest matchup in the East, with his boundless athleticism and potential for incredible outbursts. God, I love that. The Celtics oh. succeeded in containing him for the most part, though, putting up walls to the lane and closing out on his jump shots. Though they were competitive through the first three games, the Hawks were at the mercy of the Celtics and found themselves down three games to nil. With Game 4 in Atlanta and a series victory for Boston all but certain, Wilkins and backup point guard Spud Webb caught the Celtics with their foot off the gas combining for 58 points and denying them a four-game sweep. Back in Beantown for Game 5, Bird and company took the opportunity to remind the Hawks, themselves, and the league that this was their year. In one of the great statement games in playoff history, Boston turned an 11-point halftime lead into a 33-point blowout, punctuated by an absurd third quarter in which the Celtics outscored the Hawks 36-6. Defense turned into offense, offense turned into more offense, and by the end of the period, the crowd was bursting with supreme confidence in their team. They just can't believe what has happened to them. The crowd is starting to chant, beat LA. A little premature. The Celtics were a team of destiny, and the Garden knew it. Boston then easily dispatched a 57-win Bucks team in the Eastern Conference Finals. Though in fairness, Sidney Moncrief had sustained a hobbling foot injury earlier in the playoffs. He missed Game 1 and was ultimately held in check by the Celtics, who took the series in four games. 
Would a healthy Moncrief had made a difference? No. Unquestionably. I mean, would the Celtics have swept the Bucks? I think it's unlikely. But would they? When, when I when I thought he said would he have made a difference, as in, in terms of the Milwaukee Bucks winning or maybe even pushing the pushing to a seven game series, no. Sorry. Moncrief was dope, 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 but nah. This team, this, this 86 Celtics team was just too damn good, man. Still have won the series and advanced to their third straight finals? Yes. In any case, the Celtics were now four wins away from capturing their championship and submitting their application to the all-time team discussion. All they needed was a worthy opponent. And they got one. Though it wasn't the one they were expecting, that's because the defending champion Lakers had been upset in just five games by the upstart Houston Rockets and their mammoth combination of big men, 7'4 Ralph Sampson and 7'0 Akeem Olajuwon. And they intended to prove that their victory over the Lakers had been no fluke. After two Celtic victories in Boston, the series moved to Houston for the next three games. Here, the Rockets put their foot down and showed a resilience not yet seen against these Celtics earning the respect of the basketball watching public. They won game three by two points, helped in large part to Sampson's 24-point, 22-rebound performance. Jeez. Still against the ropes though, they faltered in game four, suffering a three-point defeat. With a 3-1 series lead through the first four games, the Celtics were on the brink of their destiny. They'd been able to mitigate the Rockets' size advantage on the boards, though the 23-year-old Elijah Wan had succeeded in making himself known as an intimidating and impressive young talent. With Boston looking to close out their season with a championship in Game 5, Elijah Wan played an inspired game with 34 points, 14 rebounds, and 8 blocks. Peace. The Rockets won and ensured that no championship would be hoisted on Houston's home floor, but not before damning their championship chances. Just into the second quarter of the game, Sampson had gotten a mismatch on 6-1 Jerry Seasting. After some pushing and jostling for position, Sampson turned around and delivered two quick heavy blows to Seasting, igniting a bench-clearing altercation. Sampson was subsequently ejected from the game, though Elijah Wan did carry the Rockets to a victory. I love old school basketball because them boys was just ready to fight, just ready to throw punches. You know how, how it's been the last 20 years or so where it's like, oh, I'm going I'm to like pretend to push you or, you know, I'll, I'll push you and, and pretend to act like I want to fight as I, as I hurriedly wait for my teammates to run and, and, uh, and, and pull us apart. And then I'll start resisting against them like I was ready to fight. Get out of here with all that. My boy was doing, <laughs> go, full arm extension. I, sheesh, I got to rewind that. Boy, I'm playing around, boy. Heavy blows to Seasting, igniting a Goop. bench clearing altercation. Goop. <laughs> Sampson was subsequently ejected from the game, though Elijah Wan did carry the Rockets to a victory and forced a trip back to Boston. The Celtics were pissed. They were pissed that they'd let that game get away from them. They were pissed that they'd let Houston keep the series alive. And they were pissed that Samson had squared off against a player over whom he had a 15-inch height advantage. At practice the day before Game 6, the players worked themselves into such a feverish lather, playing with so much physicality, that head coach Casey Jones had to call off practice. The Garden was no different. The fans were delirious, setting a new kind of record for malevolent trash talk, with most of their attention focused on the imposing Rockets' center. The team and their fans wanted to win, to claim their rightful place at the height of the sport, and they wanted to make the Rockets regret the day they ever messed with the Boston Celtics. And the instrument for that righteous fury was none other than Larry Bird. For one game, Larry Bird played a different sport, in what has been described and immortalized in many different ways as the greatest game he ever played. At first glance, you notice his box score wasn't all that sensational. 29 points, 11 rebounds, 12 assists on 47% shooting. He didn't score 60, it wasn't a near quadruple double, and he hit no buzzer beaters. But you only have to watch the game to see that he was, in classic bird fashion, everywhere, doing everything, at all times. Disrupting passing lanes, finding his teammates, even winning a jump ball against Elijah Wan. 
He was the king, and basketball was his kingdom. The Celtics walked out with a comfortable 17-point victory as world champions, with Bird remarking himself that it was the best performance of his career, the only one that he ever felt totally prepared for. Afterwards, Red Arback blessed the team as one of, if not the, greatest he'd ever seen. To recap, you take one of the most talented starting fives ever, composed of the greatest front court of all time, with the greatest forward tandem to ever play basketball, and watch them eviscerate their opponents with stifling two-way play, dazzling passes, suffocating defense, exquisite shooting, and sublime post play. They win more games than have ever been won by their illustrious club, and proceed to rampage their way to a championship culminating in the best game in the career of one of basketball's most brilliant talents. The Boston Garden stands no more. Demolished in 1998 after 70 years of service and replaced with a building with air conditioning. I'll never get to see it. Never get to ask the walls my questions, nor gag down a Sam Adams surrounded by insufferable Boston sports fans. Among the distinguished teams that called the parquet floor home, one stands alone. And if those walls were still around, if that floor could talk, I know what I'd ask them. And I think I already know the answer they'd give. They'd tell me that the 1986 Boston Celtics were the greatest basketball team of all time. You know, the beginning of this video, I said that I've, I've seen plenty of documentary, documentaries, seen so much on the Celtics team. And they are great, and nothing would change my mind. It's, it's the 96 Bulls. I, I'm still picking the 96 Bulls, but man, Clayton just has a way of feeding it to you. Even the information, regurgitate, regurgitating information that I already knew, but just when he explains it to you, it's just like, hmm, I knew that, but how you explained it, just, I, don't, I, don't, I don't even know how to put it to words, but, um. Man, that team, that team was loaded, man. That Celtics team, man. There is no better way to describe that that squad than hive mindset. He nailed it when he said hive mindset. That Celtics team, all the plays I've seen, all the stories I've heard, all the footage I've went through, the play by plays, they definitely have a a hive mindset, man. It's crazy. They don't need any type of verbal communication. They just always on the same page. And maybe saying always on the same page is an understatement. And that's why hive mindset is the appropriate word. And I haven't seen too many high hive mindset teams. But when you do come across them, they operate on a certain level, right? And if if I had to think about other hive mindset teams, It'd probably be uh, maybe a handful of those San Antonio Spurs teams with Greg Popovich. And maybe maybe one of those Warriors teams with Kevin Durant. But outside of that, I can't think of too many other teams that had like a hive mindset, at least on that level. I'm sure there's been others, but none I can think of right now. I tell you who did have a hive mindset defensively was the um, the 2003-2004 Detroit Pistons. Defensively, they had a hive mindset. That, is, that was an amazing defensive team. Arguably the greatest defensive squad of all time. Um, however, dude, this, yeah, that... That front court was a monster. Like I said, they could play. They could play so many different styles. They can switch players in and out of that that front court, even that back court, even to a degree, and just mix and match the players in so many ways. And everybody could play make on a at, at a minimum a decent level. Everybody could play make. Some at an elite level, some at a decent level. But they just great. They all could run the fast break. They all hustled. They all could move the ball around. They all could um, move without the basketball, take their fair share in setting screens, setting picks. The the passing was superb. And then with Bird, Bird leading the way, I mean, come on, man. 
It's a monster, monster team. And he brings up a good point. Like, mm, at the end of the day, are, are you going to mince the records over, you know, five five more losses or whatever the case may be? He, th that's a solid point, right? It's like, are you going to think... Are you going to think less of a player that averaged 30, 10, and 10 as opposed to 30, 10, and 9.9, .9, right? Really? You know, same concept. That's Dennis Johnson, as I said, super underrated as a point guard. So underrated, man. Really underrated. Nobody ever mentions his name. That was a squad, man. Bench was nasty. Yeah, they, they have a solid, solid argument. Like, if somebody said this is the greatest team of all time, I wouldn't even argue with you. I wouldn't. I I wouldn't. I, I would not argue with you. Even though I may say I'm sticking with the 96 Bulls, I'm not going to argue with you because this team is an effing beast, man. No argument. Y'all let me know what you think about it. Appreciate the support. Um, would love to hear your commentary. Like, comment, subscribe, hit the bell, stay notified, and I'll catch you on the next one. We out, baby.